Hey friend, welcome back to Planning for Cloud Risk Management Policies and Procedure. Now, in that last video, we were talking about what risk management is by defining risks and then talking a little bit about the management process of discovering and then responding to those risks after we've prioritized and kind of contextualized everything that went into it. Now, a really important part of that process was the discovery of the risks themselves. And if we're gonna try to figure out where the risks are, we gotta know where the assets are. And so in this lesson, let's spend a few minutes talking about asset management resource management, and then change and configuration management. <laughs> wow, whole bunch of management. So one of the first things to kind of keep in mind here, friends, that the goal is to maintain visibility. That's what this is all about. We got to have the right level of visibility over our resources. So let's say we got asset <laughs> visibility. Now, when we say assets, we recognize that they're very diverse definition of what an asset is. It's just anything that we get value from. But in this particular lesson, we're really thinking more about systems, services, applications, and then other management layers that might work with that. So more like the technical systems aspect of this. Keeping in mind that for most major enterprise organizations, the process of asset management, it gets normalized. So technical assets are managed just like business and property assets would as well. The point being that we can normalize what an asset is and the value that it provides and store the information in the same sort of locations. So one of the first things to kind of consider there would be the process of maintaining the inventory itself. Now, Inventory can be maintained really kind of in two different ways. The first thing would be to recognize that as new assets come into the organization, we should capture and track information about them. This implies that we have some sort of way of classifying and identifying what the informational asset is and what organization it's a part of. Keeping in mind that another key factor to track there as well would be the ownership. And really this is a direct tie back to the responsibility. So who bought the asset, who's using it and maintaining it throughout its life cycle, and then who ultimately decides when that asset is going to leave the organization. Probably one of the things that gets really tricky in this process is recognizing that you have huge diverse arrays of teams building and maintaining assets, and then some kind of generalized asset management team themselves that might be responsible or some division that's responsible just for the asset management part of it. This is why the normalization is kind of a bit of a cumbersome piece for us because you're talking about mixing assets for an audience that may not understand everything about those assets. <laughs> and so this is where a lot of that discovery comes in. Recognizing too that once the assets are in the organization, there may be changes that occur to them along the way. And so this is where we kind of consider two of those other aspects where we're thinking about how is it currently configured and that is larger uh, a part of the process of what sort of changes does it go through. For example, if a system gets updated and the lease gets extended or maybe the terms of agreement change, those important business changes and configuration changes, they need to be tracked as a part of this. And keeping in mind that as we're describing this, there have to be complementary procedures and policies that support the maintenance of the asset change and configuration management libraries as well. One of the last things to kind of recognize here is that in an asset management situation like this, tracking the configuration and changes in the inventory often requires some sort of specialized tool set. Now, many organizations might already have asset management systems installed in their environments, but that doesn't mean that they won't need to evolve them as they move into this cloud computing era. Keeping in mind that the types of assets are changing, the teams that are using them might be changing as well, and then any of these other areas like the classification, ownership, configuration, and change elements might be changing as well. And so for a lot of enterprise organizations, this means that their asset management tools and their change and config management tools need to be updated to some degree. Maybe not completely replaced, but we need to revisit some of these areas of classification, the mechanisms that are in place for allowing us to identify when things change in our environments. And then also keeping in mind that everything that we're talking about here, asset, config, and change management, they all represent one big category. These are all examples of controls. Now you might be thinking, well, I thought controls were... Um, like firewalls and security groups and things like that, Bart. Well, you're right, those are controls as well, but anything that provides a predictable measure or visibility over these assets is also a control itself. And the point that I'm trying to kind of pull us together here is recognizing when we were talking about what cloud computing is, we said that it is an increasingly automated set of services and delivery mechanisms. So if you've got an automated system and you're trying to manage it with manual controls that require change review submissions, uh, crazy review processes that take days to weeks, a lot of people touching and handing things off in between them, well, you have a fundamental oil and water situation. Highly automated systems do not pair well with manual control systems. So 
recognize that another evolution that might need to happen here is that a lot of these processes need to be automated in an increasing fashion to ensure that we can still take advantage of the value that comes from these heavily automated cloud computing solutions, whether that be a public provider or something that you've built in your own data centers. So the last piece to kind of leave you with here is recognizing that modern asset config and change management tools have really kind of conglomerated and smushed themselves together uh, into kind of enterprise resource management. That would be kind of the super umbrella. And there are a lot of tools that are available in the third party market out there and tools that come directly from our vendors or maybe even a composite of their services that help us with this process. So let's actually spend a few minutes kind of jumping on over there and we will see what else they've got available. So one of the first things I wanted to kind of take a look at here is over in AWS, if you take a look in the inventory, uh, there's a couple of different services that pop up when you look at inventory. One of the first ones that shows up here is AWS Config. Now, AWS Config is a service that goes out there and first discovers resources that you've built in your AWS environments. And these could be a very diverse array of resources. And then it identifies what the current baseline configuration is of those tools. And then later on, as changes are made to them, it can identify what they would call the delta, which is the change that's occurred. And then you can apply various automated processes to decide if that's a concern that needs to be re uh, responded to. After that, you can see there's another one in here called Systems Manager. And Systems Manager and then also the Application Discovery Service are there to help you manage the assets themselves, what they're doing, where they're configured, and the changes that are happening to them over time. The coolest thing about this is that these are all very heavily integrated tools that are native to the AWS ecosystem. Similarly, if you take a look over here in Microsoft Azure and look for uh, inventory, cool, let's give it a search. Oops, let me go back up here. <laughs> and if you take a look over here in the resources, there is a document that talks about how inventory and visibility can be handled in Azure. And what they're kind of trying to point out here, the key thing to take away is that it's not a single system or service that does it for you, but rather a collection of services, the logging services, the monitoring services, they have uh, change and tracking that can be done down to a variety of different levels. They also talk about getting inside of the guest operating systems. So this is a great one to kind of pull back for a sec. Remember earlier when we were talking about administering and securing cloud environments, we said there's like two different realms. There are things that are happening inside of the workloads, the users, the operating systems, the applications that live there. And then there are the cloud level configurations where people are actually building and maintaining all of those resources. Each one of those has their own types of assets. So you may also find that you have to install agents or deploy special software in your workload environments to capture all the important information that's relevant to you and your teams. So kind of continuing on down here, you also keep in mind that now that you're looking at cloud resources, the context is important. Where the virtual machine lives might be just as critical as identifying what operating system is running on that particular virtual machine. And so here they're talking about Azure Network Watcher, looking at the DNS traffic that's happening in your environment. One of the big things that you kind of heard me mention a minute ago is the idea of a baseline. Very important principle here. A lot of the asset change and config management processes are about understanding what is normal and then looking at the variations that are occurring over time, capturing them and making sure that we have the right level of visibility. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to talk about here as well is uh, imagine that you're dealing with uh, more like a software as a service application, like here's my Google Drive. Your software as a service application might have a variety of other tools that are plugged in and hooked up to the side of it. So for example, here in my Google Drive account, you can see some of these other services that are available to use and have permission to interact with my environments. These definitely need to be considered in scope. And in a previous lesson, you heard me talking about cloud management platforms. Cloud management platforms often fit directly into the resource management world, just like we've been describing here. They have the ability to discover, manage, and monitor, and then inform uh, in an action or an event sort of scenario when something has happened to those resources. Keeping in mind too that a lot of it's done at a very highly integrated level. And so we recognize that in the world of asset config and change management, the name of the game is understanding what we have to protect and the right contextual information about the classification, the ownership of, and then the configuration and the changes that are occurring to those assets over time. This can certainly be handled using our own internal change asset and config management tools, but in a broader perspective, a lot of enterprises are going for new tools that are able to kind of collect all of those pieces in one place and provide an even better level of uh, visibility and increasingly important, actionability. <laughs> now that we have diverse locations with more and more cloud vendors getting involved as well in a more diverse array of assets and locations, that process has got to be sufficiently automated to be able to keep up with all the rate of change that we're seeing in our environments.
And so in the end, we kind of come back all the way around to the importance of uh, automation and getting the right types of controls in the right place to keep that value proposition strong. So in the lessons ahead, we're going to talk about one really common talked about risk, and that is the idea of vendor lock-in or data portability. How does that work in the cloud computing era? Did it get worse? Is it getting better? <laughs> Where do we stand? So stick with me, friends, and I'll see you there. I hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing.